We're going to calculate the gain of a common collector amplifier. This amplifier is also called an emitter follower. In this video, we're going to ignore things like parasitics, so you could consider that this derivation is a simple one. Let's get started. We're starting with an AC signal, and the goal is to amplify that signal. The common collector amplifier is a non-inverting amplifier. It means that when the signal reaches the load, it's not going to be inverted. Let's trace the signal's path as it moves through the amplifier. It first crosses the source impedance, and anytime you have a source impedance, you can expect the voltage to drop. Our amplifier, in other words, is going to have some input impedance. From the perspective of the AC signal, we won't see the capacitor, we'll only see this voltage divider. If the input impedance Rn is large relative to Rs, then the voltage drop across Rs might be negligible. Of course, that's what we want. We want to design an amplifier that has a high input impedance so that the signal doesn't drop. It's thus advantageous to make R1 and R2 as large as possible. But of course, if you make them too large, then the input impedance to the base of the transistor itself might start to become non-negligible. I recommend an upper limit of R1 and R2 in the tens of kiloohm range. What is Rn, by the way? Well, we have one path going up here to an AC ground, and we have one path going down here to a ground. The input impedance, from the perspective of the AC signal, is R1 in parallel with R2. Let's call the AC portion of the signal that gets past the capacitor Vn. For the moment, I'm going to neglect any attenuation that the capacitor might cause. In other words, I'm going to assume that the capacitor is large. If the capacitor is too small and our frequency is too low, then it starts to look like a high-pass filter and our signal might start to attenuate. We're going to neglect that attenuation. How about the DC portion of our signal? Well, there's no DC portion that's coming in from the left of a capacitor because a capacitor blocks all of the DC signals. However, our power supply voltage is a DC signal. What fraction of it is going to appear at the base of this transistor? It's a simple voltage divider. Some fraction of our power supply voltage is going to show up there. If R1 and R2 are equal, then the DC voltage here at the base is just going to be half the power supply voltage. The full voltage at our base is going to be that DC portion of the signal plus our AC VN. What we have here at our base is a VN, but the center point is our DC offset. At this point, I should stop and remind you that it's very important that this combination of VN plus the fraction of our power supply voltage always be above 0.7 volts. If that combination were to sometimes fall below 0.7 volts, then our base emitter junction would no longer be forward biased and it would drive our transistor into cutoff. Our amplifier then wouldn't work as expected. For now, we'll assume that our power supply voltage is high enough so that that never happens. Let's now find our emitter voltage. We're going to be assuming that the transistor is always in the forward active mode and that it's a silicon transistor. That means that we should always have a 0.7 volt forward drop from the base to the emitter. This emitter voltage is just our base voltage minus 0.7 volts. This voltage, of course, has to be above zero. If this combination were to hypothetically give you a negative number, it's a sign that the calculation is no longer correct because it would imply that current would need to go the wrong way through this resistor. We've already assumed that it's going in this direction, so we would reach a contradiction. To ensure that the transistor is always in the forward active mode, we also need to make sure that our collector voltage is always higher than our base voltage. To make sure that the collector voltage is always high, we could simply get rid of the collector resistor and tie the collector directly to our DC power supply. The larger the collector resistor you choose, the lower VC is going to be. If the collector resistor is too large, then you might drive the transistor into saturation. Let's now assume that our transistor is not in saturation and calculate our load voltage. Our load voltage is essentially the same as our emitter voltage, and we'll assume that the capacitor has effectively blocked all of the DC portion of the signal and allowed in only the AC portion. The DC portion is in blue, so we're just left with the red portion. However, we do have to consider the fact that we have an output impedance associated with our amplifier as well. In other words, do I need to have a ratio here next to my VN from some voltage divider? Well, as a matter of fact, I do. If our output impedance is too high, our signal is going to be attenuated by the voltage divider. 
What is our output impedance here? Well, looking back into our circuit, we find an emitter resistor in parallel with whatever resistance the transistor gives us looking up into its emitter. Although we're not going to go into the reasons here, that resistance tends to be very small. For that reason, we can neglect the output impedance. Let's now draw an equivalent circuit for our amplifier. We already have the input side done. What the transistor does is it takes your input voltage and replicates it at the emitter. From the perspective of the AC signal only, this is what the entire amplifier looks like. Because we have AC in and AC out, it doesn't really matter if some DC signal gets added to it and then removed from the signal somewhere inside the amplifier. What's the total gain of our circuit? In other words, what's our output voltage divided by our input voltage? Well, we start off with a voltage divider. Then, because this is VN, and this is also VN, the gain of the amplifier itself is just one. Finally, we have a voltage divider at the output side. In this video, I'm not going to describe how to find an exact value for R out because that involves something internal to the transistor and we've not talked about it yet. But for the moment, I can just mention that if you make good choices for your emitter resistor RE and your resistors R1 and R2, you can typically neglect it. In other words, let's proceed on the assumption that R out is small relative to the load resistance. We can also often neglect the source resistance. It means that the overall gain of a common collector amplifier that's properly designed is normally about one. That means that a common collector amplifier properly designed can function as a buffer. Now, when you look at circuits and you see an amplifier that's common collector, you can almost by inspection just say, ah, that amplifier has a gain of one. Let's look at an example now and calculate the voltages in more detail. And we'll also look at the capacitors as well. First of all, we're going to assume that the capacitors do not attenuate the signal and we're supposed to find the voltage gain. Because I can identify this as a common collector circuit, my instinct is to just simply say, ah, the gain is one. We now need to look at the circuit in detail and check all the underlying assumptions behind my assertion that the gain is one. First, let's concentrate on the DC portion of the circuit. Let's make sure, in other words, that the transistor is properly biased in the forward active mode. We have a 10 volt supply and two 10 kilo ohm resistors. That means that we should have five volts here at the base of the transistor. Assuming that the transistor is properly biased, we should have a 0.7 volt drop to the emitter. That gives us 4.3 volts here at the emitter. So far, so good. What's our voltage at the collector? Well, to find it, we're going to have to know what the DC current is down from the power supply to the collector. Let's find our emitter current, first of all. With 4.3 volts dropping across one kilo ohm, our DC current should be 4.3 milliamps. We should have a similar current flowing at the collector. Our DC collector voltage is then 10 minus 4.3 milliamps times 100. It comes out to 9.57 volts. Let's briefly make sure our base current is negligible. With a beta around 100 and 4.3 milliamps flowing through the right side of the circuit, the base current is about 0.043 milliamps. Let's compare that current to the current flowing through the 10 kilo ohm resistor, which ought to be 5 divided by 10,000, or 0.5 milliamps. Comparing 0.5 to 0.043 milliamps, the base current is indeed negligible, so the 5 volt label at the base is accurate. Let's compare our voltages. Is the collector voltage always higher than the base voltage? Yes. Is the base voltage always 0.7 volts higher than the emitter? Yes. It appears that this transistor is properly biased in the forward active mode. Of course, it needs to stay biased in the forward active mode as our input voltage swings high and swings low. Let's check that now. We have an AC signal here at the input side. Since it's AC, we know that the average voltage is zero. I say here that it has a 0.1 volt peak to peak amplitude. That means that on the high side, it reaches 0.05 volts. On the low side, it swings down to minus 0.5 volts. What does that signal look like on this side of the 10 ohm resistor? Well, we're definitely going to have a voltage drop across the 10 ohm resistor, but is the voltage drop going to be significant or not? To answer that question, we need to know what the input impedance is of our amplifier. When I look into this amplifier, I see a 10 kilo ohm resistor connected to an AC ground and another 10 kilo ohm resistor connected to ground. I also see a transistor, but I'm going to assume that the input impedance to the transistor's base is large relative to the 10 kilo ohm resistors. 
This means that my input impedance is nearly 10 kilo ohms in parallel with 10 kilo ohms or 5 kilo ohms. I'm going to have a voltage divider then set up between the 10 ohm resistor and 5 kilo ohms. Because 10 ohms is so small relative to the input impedance, I'm not going to have a significant voltage drop across the 10 ohm resistor itself. It means that my signal at this point is going to look identical to my input voltage. It's going to be an AC signal and it's going to swing up to almost 0.05 volts and it's going to swing down to almost negative 0.05 volts. We're now going to assume that the capacitors do not attenuate the signal. If that's true, then we're going to get exactly the same signal on the other side of our capacitor. The difference though is that it now has a DC portion added to it. It's still an AC signal, but it's centered at 5 volts it rises up to 5.05 volts. When the signal swings down, it goes down to 4.95 volts. The amplitude's the same, it's just centered at a different DC bias point. What does the signal look like at the emitter? Well, we need to subtract 0.7 from it. It was 5 volts in the center, now it's 4.3 volts. It swinged up to 5.05 volts, now it's going to swing up to 4.35 volts. It'll be swinging down to 4.25 volts, won't it? It's still an AC signal, it only has a DC offset. We're going to be neglecting the output impedance of a transistor. Now let's consider the output signal. Our load resistor is just grounded, the other side of it is connected to a capacitor, so we know that the DC portion of the signal has to be at zero volts. The AC portion of the signal, though, is going to go right through that capacitor. It's going to then swing up by 0.05 volts. It's going to swing down by 0.05 volts. I can see that the load resistance here is large. When making up the example problem, I purposely made it large because I don't want to deal with the output impedance. What's my conclusion here about the voltage gain? Well, we started at the input side with a signal that was 0.1 volts peak to peak, and we wound up at the load with a signal that was 0.1 volts peak to peak. What we have then is an amplifier with a gain of exactly one. What good is a voltage amplifier with a gain of one? Well, in this case, it doesn't really do much, but a buffer is in fact very useful. Having a voltage gain of one doesn't necessarily mean that it has a power gain of one. The power gain can still hypothetically be higher than one. In this case, for example, where does the current come from that drives our load resistor? It doesn't come from the source, it actually comes from our DC power supply. That's why sometimes voltage amplifiers, even with a gain of one, can be useful. When working through this example, the only thing that we haven't really considered is the capacitors. Were they sized correctly? Let's look at example two, which asks us if the signal is a radio signal, are the capacitors large enough? The input impedance from the perspective of the AC signal here is five kilo ohms. This looks a lot like a high pass filter, doesn't it? In fact, it is a high pass filter. Let's find its corner frequency. As you might recall from my video on one pole filters, the frequency of a single pole high pass filter is given by one over two pi RC. Let's plug in some numbers here. The corner frequency works out to be 318 Hertz. It means that signals with frequencies higher than 318 Hertz will tend to pass the filter, whereas lower frequencies will be blocked. In this case, we're dealing with radio signals. Signals. Radio signals have frequencies in the hundreds of kilohertz or megahertz range, very high frequencies compared to 318 hertz. In other words, our AC signal from the source is going to have no trouble at all passing right through that 100 nanofarad capacitor. You might even say that the capacitor was oversized. We could have used a smaller capacitor without any problem at all. For example, a 1 nanofarad capacitor would have worked just fine. How about at our output side? We also have a high pass filter over here. What's its corner frequency? In this case, it's only 1.6 Hertz. Again, absolutely no problem for our radio signal to get through it. The calculation of these corner frequencies, by the way, is not entirely correct because it's influenced by resistors on the other side of the capacitors as well. But I think I've shown here that we're so far away from being able to influence or attenuate our radio signals that it's not going to matter. In the next video, we're going to look at the common emitter configuration. In the common emitter configuration, it turns out that you can have voltage gains with magnitudes higher than one, and it's also an inverting amplifier.